you're all very, very welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Brundle. I'm the research director at Ulster University, chief executive of Innovation Ulster, and current chair of Young Enterprise. You're all very welcome to this session, which is focused on innovation in an emergency. This session is about the response that Northern Ireland made to the pandemic. Uh, Northern Ireland is regarded around the world as being an exemplar in that response. And what we have today are those people who were involved in making sure that that response came about, the people that made it happen. So I'm very, 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 very pleased and honoured to be joined today uh, by, in order, Eddie, Claire and Andrew. Um, I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves. Um, we have a very short space of time to talk today, and we have a whole lot to talk about. So I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to start with Eddie, and I'm going to ask them to explain who they are, what they do, and what the first technology was that they ever loved. Eddie, you're up first. Thank you. Um, Eddie O'Neill, I'm a doctor by trade, uh, been working in digital health space since 2015. Currently on secondment to the Department of Health, working in digital health and care in Northern Ireland and been leading on a number of things in the pandemic, including the current uh, COVID certification service. Um, the first bit of technology that really sort of switched me on to technology was a laptop I was given when I was doing a role as a medical advisor looking at junior doctor's hours. I'd previously regarded everybody with BBC laptops and sort of who could do code as being nerds and they skewed it completely, but uh, discovered that Windows was quite accessible and that programs could do stuff that you used to have to hand other people do. So it was the first thing that switched me on to technology. Thank you, Eddie. Claire, you're over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Tim. My name's Claire Bushner. I am official title of Assistant Director of Digital and Nursing. I'm one of the senior team in the DHCNI team, or the Digital Health and Care Northern Ireland team, and employed by the Public Health Agency. Um, my day job consists of having quite an eclectic portfolio of things um, to include the rewrite of the health and social care, digital health and care strategy, uh, looking at capacity and capability building within professional IT and informatics staff across HSC and health and social care advisory to digital. Uh, for my sins and because I maybe was in the wrong place at the wrong time, since last November I've been leading up the vaccination program, the digital aspects of the COVID vaccination program and soon to be the digital aspects of the COVID and flu vaccination program. Excellent. Andrew. I don't think I can follow that. <laughs> so I'm Andrew Bruce, as it says on, on, the, on the screen behind us here. I'm in charge of delivery for Explao in Northern Ireland. Explao is a global consultancy. We have about 15,000 people across the planet. And we got involved in the pandemic through uh, becoming partners in the application development, uh, firstly in Dublin um, for the proximity uh, uh, application in, in Dublin, then Northern Ireland and then Scotland, and subsequently we've been involved in the vaccine certi certification scheme um, here in Northern Ireland as well, and I'm possibly about to get involved in Scotland as well. So we've, we've been partnering with the, the fair people here on the sofa beside us to, to help them with the technology side of things. And the first piece of technology I loved was a thing called a Casio SK-1, which was a sampling keyboard, because I really didn't want to go into technology, I wanted to be a pop star. Um, but unfortunately, um, despite my Casio SK-1, I found out that that required a modicum of talent that I didn't have. Thank you, Andrew. I forgot and to do my technology, Tim. Go for it. So, as it says, my title, I'm a nurse, and I was frantically trying, it must be my age, I couldn't really remember when I got my first computer or anything like that, but I do remember when they introduced electronic blood pressure monitors to the wards. And for any of you that um, have ever watched a nurse fumble around by wrapping them all the material around your arm and pumping the thing up, to have something with Velcro on it that did it automatically for you was transformational. Fantastic. For me, it was a dot matrix printer. I just love the sound of it, and I still love the sound of it. It's something I need to get hold of. So in February 2020, if anybody can remember that period in time before all this thing that happened happened, uh, I went to a meeting in London and I got um, berated along with other university directors because there was a feel that the UK government's investment in digital services was not producing 
uh, the skills born out of research that we might need to thrive, that um, the investments that the private equity market were making in technology were too short term and too trivial, that the resilience of, of the, the national digital infrastructure wasn't being invested in, and we wouldn't be ready for um, a large scale shock to the system. Um, didn't think much of it, went, by, went to see a football match that night, came back the next day, and by the following Tuesday, we had closed the university to all but essential labs. And in the months that followed, uh, we repurposed our laboratories right across Ulster University to do um, COVID testing, um, to do testing of PPE equipment. We were involved in a couple of vaccine trials. And over the course of the last 18 months, we've been gradually ensuring that it is a safe place for students, researchers, academics to continue their work. Now, meanwhile, in Northern Ireland, there were great accolades being um, placed on those people who were managing the response, the digital response in Northern Ireland, those people who are on the stage today. So we are respected um, and recognised around the world as one of those first, well, I think the first place in the world to have interoperability between, um, between different jurisdictions and different systems. Um, to have interoperability with digital services. We were first to market with many aspects of the digital response. My first question, though, is how this turned from being something on a news broadcast, this pandemic became something that moved from being something that was part of a, from a news broadcast or something you'd read about to becoming part of your daily working life. Eddie, you're up. I um, have to say my mind at the start, probably around February time, was about securing tickets for the Six Nations match down in Dublin with uh, Italy. And whether or not it was going to be cancelled was probably the, the, the initial focus. I think like a lot of people, initially there was an element of complacency. And I think then some of the pictures we saw from Italy with hospitals at bursting point and with it people making life and death decisions because there just wasn't enough capacity. I think that brought it home that this was something different and I think people started to really pay attention. I got a phone call, one of the people that's not here that's probably been responsible for a lot of the innovation in the health space is Dan West, the Chief Digital Information Officer. I got a phone call from Dan saying, come on up to the Department of Health, we're setting up a digital cell as part of the pandemic response. and. Uh, I haven't stopped working flat out since. Uh, I have had a few days off, but it's been few and far between. And, and we'll come back to the things that you've been doing on your days on in a, in a moment. But Claire, I just wanted to know whether you wanted to... Yeah, well, my, my journey, because I've been involved in the vaccine, the vaccine program started a wee bit later. Um, and it was, it came on the back of we met, we met or we heard that Scotland were, ha, had quite a big digital input into the thinking of setting up the vaccination programme. And we approached the department and said, you know, Scotland are thinking that they might need some, you might need something digital to do with this vaccine programme. I said, yeah, that would be a good idea. And that was the beginning of November of 2020. And we went live on the 8th of December. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Andrew. Uh, well, I remember it very well. It was uh, Tuesday morning, and uh, we got a phone call from, from the Dublin office to say that um, the, the, through a back channel, the MD had heard that uh, the Irish government was about to shut the schools. Um, and I remember saying, well, you know, that's not quite the same up here, and him telling me he didn't really care. Uh, he wanted me to get 100 of our consultants, all 100 of our consultants, off-site um, uh, with, within the shortest pace uh, of time possible for their safety. Um, and all of a sudden it became a, a different thing. And in terms of innovation, uh, it, there was a fair amount of innovative thinking how to go into persuading, particularly um, our clients in government, and, uh, uh, how we could allow people to work from home, but without a high degree of security clearance. Um, over the next three weeks or so, that was all um, managed in place. Uh, and before we knew it, we had everybody working from home in the, in the whole company. And at that point, then we got a phone call from Eddie saying, "Well, would you like to come and help us with the uh, with the proximity app?" And of course, we were delighted to do that. Thank you. And I'd like to focus in, Claire and Eddie, on on 
that initial request, so you know, when the problem became a, a product or at least as a, a, a requirement, so I'm keen to understand how we went from there's a problem, there's a need for a digital solution, and it looks like X or it needs to do X. So I'm keen to understand what was going on in those initial meetings for both of you respectively on how a digital component of the response might come about? Um, Claire, from yeah, go with you first. Well, hmm, what was going on in those meetings? Um, <laughs> trying to get the business owner. So, of course, my, my official title is that I'm the product manager. So I was translating the business need into the digital product trying to get the business owner, which was the Department of Health and the trusts and general practice and community pharmacy, to specify what their requirements were and what they actually wanted. And that was a very, very new thing. You know, in health and social care, practitioners of all varieties are used, with no offense, with used to technology being presented to them and being told, there's a thing that will make your job a lot easier and they just say, oh yes, thank you very much, and they either use it and it's great, or they put it in their drawer or hide it in a cupboard somewhere, um, and it, it never sees the light of day. So for us to approach them and say, well, what would you like this thing to actually do was a really big challenge to them, because they didn't realize that what way we designed the product would affect the data that came out of the other end of it. So we started probably from the, from the, from the back end and said, well, Imagine in three months' time, the minister says to you, how many vaccines have we, you know, what do you think the questions the minister is going to ask you? What do you think we're going to have to put on our dashboard? And they said, oh, we're going to need to know the number of over 60s, the number of people in care homes, the number of nurses, the number of doctors. I said, right, let's go from there. And we, we, went, we went back that way until we got some sort of a specification. But it was iteration after iteration after iteration. Yeah. And Eddie, was it a similar experience for you? I mean, you were you were there right at the beginning, I guess. Yeah, at that stage, it was fairly unformed. Groups were getting together. There was a sort of instruction, just get yourself in there and make yourself useful. So it started off with the pandemic helpline. There was a lot of uh, unrest amongst general practice and urgent care because patients were coming up in very, very high numbers as a result of speaking to the helpline. So I got in there and uh, found out that the call, they were using call scripts that was telling everybody with any symptoms at all to get themselves in to see a doctor, which wasn't the right advice. So I, I suddenly started uh, writing call scripts for call handlers to triage symptoms, make sure those who could self-manage, self-managed. And then that, that had an overnight impact and the numbers dropped way down. Uh, but we were getting thousands and thousands of calls, about six, 7,000 calls through the helpline on a daily basis. So uh, Dan said to me, go and do an app. So I was put in with some developers and some designers and basically reproduced the, the, the triage script in a digital format. And that was incredible because that reduced the calls from 6,000 to about 600 a day. But we saw that digital shift into people using the app self-diagnosing and self-managing. We were getting five, 6,000 journeys through and only about 13, 14% being passed on to secondary care. So that, that was, we turned that round in 14 days. Um, we were one of the first symptom checkers out in the world, let alone the UK. And then on hot on the heels of that proximity app, we turned that round in two, three, couple of months. And then there was things like digital relay service for sign language. Uh, and uh, the current thing, which is the COVID certification, which is not without its contro controversy. Indeed, and we, we may, if we get a bit of time, come back to, the, to that controversy. But it, it, I'm keen to go back to, if you look at whether it be the, the systems checker or the proximity app, where the requirement came from and where the decision was made to go or not go with those digital solutions. Well, I think we'd had the real world example that you could alleviate pressure on frontline services by giving people information that helped them to make their own decisions. Yeah. And if you could do that in a safe way and a reliable way, then that was a big win. Yeah. So we, we saw the initial, you know, from, from the initial 
uh, figures that we saw on the helpline from that type of intervention. It wasn't a huge leap to put that into the format of an, amp, an app and a web form to allow people to sort of self-service and the, the benefits we got from that were measurable, demonstrable and it was fantastic. Also the figures that we were getting from the symptoms were helping the modelers. Yep. So the people that help advise the department on where the pandemic is, what the projections are and help the decisions to be made about when to lock down or when to release. They were getting information from our digital products as well that were helping to do that. So it was, it was quite rewarding to see rapid deployment and to see the results of that and the impact that that had. I think the, I mean, I said up front, I mean, I think there, there are many, um, there's much recognition for the speed of our response and the way we handled the response. But I think one other aspect of this is the, the partnership nature of, of the way we worked um, lent itself well to bringing those through. And I'm keen, I suppose, to hear from, from both of you on how you put your teams together. I'm also keen to hear about how companies got brought in, how universities got brought in, how consultants got brought in, and how you built up that, that expertise. Claire, I don't know if, if you could go first. Yeah, well, team is a bit of a fuzzy concept. Um, so it started as a team of one, and it's now a team of three. Um, and others have, have come and gone as, we, as we've gone across the, month, uh, uh, across the months. And it has been really, a, it has been a moving feast. So, um, I mean, once we, I mean, our, our need was identified because we knew that the vaccination programme was going to have to be rolled out to every citizen in Northern Ireland. And our current, you know, our current systems couldn't have dealt with, you know, everybody going to their GP or everybody. So we needed to have a standardised way to be able to do that. And, you know, we had learnt from the app and the self-service type of approach and that people actually engaged in being able to do it for themselves. So the self, the booking, the public booking side of that, um, you know, became a really big part and a real game changer for health and social care in Northern Ireland because people here had never been able to book their own appointments to do anything um, with regards to health and social care. So for me, the team, there was the digital health and care NI team. Then we had, um, we had our, our suppliers and I had a num we had a number of suppliers on. So we had user designers um, as well as the company who supplied the, the front end booking platform um, and the tactical solution for trust to use and then we had a supplier who was building our minimal viable product to become our strategic product that we're that all all users are are, are utilizing now and um, with regards to the data analytics side yes we had the strategic information board we had the public health agency and other data analysts as well as academics helping us out on the obviously on the modeling of how the vaccine uptake was going so it has been an absolute you know, what I joke to say, it was a team of three. It has been a huge, a huge piece of work across, you know, a multi multitude of people. Um, and the people have made it. Yeah. And everybody has, you know, Eddie and, I, Eddie and I joke, Eddie and I are only 21. We only look like this because we've been working in this program. Um, I've had six days off since last November, but I'm going on holidays next week. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, everybody has really bent over and worked the extra hours because we knew it was the right thing to do and that goes for suppliers and everybody who has worked yeah. as a as a whole team yeah i suppose that you know if eddie could could comment on the same theme but also i'm interested you know to, to bring andrew back into the conversation how the procurement was managed and how um how companies were then able to engage and provide support to the team? I think it's only been possible to deliver the range of things. I mean, Digital Health and Care Northern Ireland has delivered over 20 products and solutions. It's been mammoth, and to do that in the time scale... Could you give us a flavour of those? Just the There's audience? been a whole range of stuff. I mean, I, I've already mentioned the apps that we produce, symptom checkers, proximity apps. There was also a self-trace app. There's been different solutions as well um, for vaccine management, for uh, track and trace, you know, the, the testing. There's been so many things that have supported, I mean, sign language, B BSL, ISL um, users were being excluded because with, with the pandemic, uh, everything went to telephone services, naturally to try and create distancing 
and mitigate the spread of infection. There was a whole community that were completely isolated from those health services. Um, there had been several years of attempts to procure a solution for them to be able to get sign language interpretation remotely. We were able to accelerate that in a few weeks, and you know, with the co cooperation of colleagues across the water in the 111 service, and with local commissioners in the public health agency, we did a fantastic job. We got that out the door, and it was transformational for that group of people early in the pandemic. So, you know, there's been lots of different collaborations, lots of partnerships. So, you know, I think key has been the sort of public-private sector partnership. Um, private sector, there's, there's, there's so many resources and, and expertise there that can accelerate you to delivery if you get the right people involved at the design stage. But also as well, you know, before you get products out the door, there's the QA testing, the pen testing, things, you know, before I got involved in developing an app in March, I had never thought about. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're in the middle of it, immersed, but you see what's possible. And, you know, things that previously wouldn't have been possible suddenly were being delivered as though it's commonplace. But that comes at a price. I mean, certainly, as Claire said, I think I put in some like 450 hours of overtime with the proximity app in, 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 two, in a month or two months. It was crazy. Mm. Um, I've got a lot more canny now about making sure the business case covers staff substitution and management resource. <laughs> Um, and Andrew, it's now time for your big sales pitch. You know, it's a, a, a keen to understand how Xplayo got in, got embedded in the midst of this and your role. Well, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, to be honest with you. Was, I mean, we, when the pandemic hit, we, we put a call out basically on social media and said, like, if anybody needs help, please come to us. Uh, we, we'll figure out a way of helping regardless of anything else. Um, and then, you know, th that happened with, you know, the likes of Eddie and so on reached out to us. The same happened in, in Dublin and, and in Edinburgh. Um, and we started getting taken up in the offer. And, and the first thing that we noticed was, of course, that a pandemic moves at a different pace from public sector procurement. <laughs> so, Shocker. I know, amazingly. And so we found ourselves in a position of having to work on these applications, some of which may, in fact, in, in Scotland's case, did come through, become registered as clinical devices. And you can't do that without insurance, and we don't have insurance without a contract. And if you're working for, for free ahead of getting paid, uh, or not getting paid at all, because you've offered to do it for free, you don't have a contract. So we had to figure out fairly imaginative ways of, of working for, for the public sector um, without actually having contracts in place, or contracts that didn't require us to get paid, at least in the short term. Um, and and that, that, I think actually the fact that we managed to figure out how to do that then spurred on further engagement with, uh, with the agencies. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, think think the key word, I think the key word that Andrew used there was imaginative. <laughs> there has been some very imaginative <laughs> partnerships going on um, over this. And I have to say, there is, not, there is not one of the suppliers that we have worked mm. with across the bill that have not worked at risk because of the dichotomy between public sector procurement mm -hmm. and the way that public sector normally do things and the speed of the pandemic. You know, they, everybody has, you know, I said it about the teamwork, but pulled out all the stops. And Andrew's right. You know, suppliers came and said, can we do anything to help? You know, they, they approached us um, and, you know, and we took a little bit from this one and a little bit from this one and a little bit from this one you know, to make to make up the sort of the end to end 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 products. And there was a, there was a network of suppliers there. We find ourselves calling on our suppliers quite often as well. When we did the performance testing for the application in Scotland, there was a potential for six million people to download this application in an hour. And uh, that, to, to test that is an expensive operation. When we went to some of our colleagues, people like Neotis, and they just said, "We'll do it for free. We, you know, this is about keeping people safe. We'll just we'll we'll take the cost." We'll try and absorb some of the risk that's in the health service, um, and we'll do it for free. Fantastic. Eddie? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. I mean, the, the reason that uh, Andrew got a phone call uh, was the fact that our colleagues in the Republic were incredibly generous. There had been an initial uh, move towards proximity apps being centralized, and then I think the mood switched and the ICO's influence around GDPR switched it to a decentralized model. So the Republic, our colleagues in the Republic and Digital Health were so generous in allowing us to benefit from some of the work that had already gone on in terms of testing in the field, the Google Apple API. So, you know, there's that bit that we then helped the Scottish, you know, and there's been that cooperation, interoperability was developed between ourselves and the Republic because of that close relationship. And there's been a, you know, it's, it's also the generosity of the, countries to, uh, the companies to proceed at risk. 
you know, before we could get funding in place. Quite often we were hitting them with what the requirement was, a deadline, getting in place delivery schedules while we sorted out the contracts and the finance. And I think without that courage and leap of faith, we probably would have been nowhere. <laughs> I've got to ask a question. It's probably of interest to me and nobody else. Um, but in, in the early part of my career, I was always taught that science without engineering and engineering without sci science are both futile endeavors. Um, and I'm interested to, to understand what the interplay was like for each of you between the clinicians, the technologists, um, and the commissioners, and, and so on, and how, how science influenced the rollout or the development of these services? Eddie, you're up first. <laughs> um, I think just having a clinical background and scientific background allows me to be pragmatic and evaluate evidence. So, you know, when proximity apps were at, a, at their infantile sort of development stage and they were doing tests on bus in the middle of Dublin and uh, in Louise Collins' handbag at one yeah. point, yeah. <laughs> you know, this stuff, you had to be able to evaluate, is this going to fly or not? So science was important to be able to set your quality benchmark. It also was important in that when we were designing the dashboards and information that we were gathering, for instance, from the symptom checker, that we were working with the data scientists to be able to provide reliable data that the epidemiologists could use to be able to make the decisions that affected all of our lives. So. You know, there's, there's, there's both ends of the spectrum. Um, I, I joke quite often that I'm a pretend technologist. I'm a clinician masquerading as a technologist, but you know, there's that bit about asking the stupid questions. And quite often when you ask people questions and, and get to the really the underlying elements without being blinded by the jargon, quite often you can see logic flows or way things that could be done differently that actually help push the technologists in a different direction. So it's that people being prepared to uh, drop their ego and work in a constructive and collaborative way has been fantastic and it's been a great experience I've really enjoyed it even though we joke that we've been absolutely exhausted it's been fantastic I don't think I've ever enjoyed my work as much in terms of feeling engaged and making things happen and I think the companies that we've worked with have responded really positively too and you know a lot of the guys would report back this is the best projects they've ever worked on you know because they're doing something that their neighbors are aware of and it's on the news you know Claire, did you want to add? Yeah, from well, all of the above. For me, I'll, I'll go the, the the sort of the service the service side. Um, so, you know, in the vaccination program, we had the mass vaccination clinics. You will all have visited one of those um, GPs and community community pharmacy, um, and they all accepted um, the challenge of using technology in a slightly different way, um, and and some downright refused they just weren't at the place where where they wanted they they couldn't see how they could use the product and the technology at the point of care so there was you know there's something about understanding when you're doing something so rapidly that there has to be a lot of hand holding and a lot of change management about process and we were rather unfortunate that trusts in the mass vaccination clinics had a process already defined about what you know process defined and when we did the user journey and the product was matched to that process you know getting them then to adapt from the paper that they had been using to the product was a huge culture shock yeah. um, and the other big thing that is done so you will hear practitioners from a clinical background saying oh yes we use evidence-based practice which means all of their practice is based on data and evidence that they have read and and whatever um, and if anything the vaccine management program has highlighted how data should be used to make decisions um, and it has really highlighted the importance of recording uh, for clinicians to record good data because eddie's See, we're sitting far apart on the sofa because my dirty data in my vaccine management system has given him headaches in his COVID certification system. Um, the clinicians, uh, the, you know, the mantra at the beginning of the vaccine program was jab, 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 as fast as we can. And we'll think about the data later. And then three months down the line, when the dashboard was slightly out of kilter and we didn't know what was happening here and we didn't know what was happening here, all of a sudden there was a highlight on the data 
and clinicians then eventually sat up and thought, this is actually really, really important yeah. that we do this right. And their mindset has completely changed and we're in the second iteration of the product now to roll out in next week. And they are all over. Was you on holiday? <laughs> no, I'm going the following week. Oh, okay. I'll okay. leave them all to break at the well, following week. I'm going to ask a, a final question because we're, we're almost out of time. And you've each, you've each described things that you've had to do differently, things that, um, things that you've had to change, ways in which we've had to, to work differently, and we've all experienced that in, in whatever um, part of life we, we are in. But I'm interested in the things that we had to break that we've no intention of fixing. You know, the things that we're, we're going to take with us into a, into a post-COVID era. Andrea, I don't know whether you could you could go first on this one. Sure. Well, the obvious one is is the, the hybrid working and working from home and so on. And I think that that's going to be talked about a lot. Um, and so, I, you know, I'd not add to the into the conversation at this point, but it's something actually which is closer to my own heart, and that is, you know, working with Alexa Claire and Eddie and the clinicians and and, and working in a pandemic, it sharpens the mind. Um, and it, it, it removes a lot of the pomposity that maybe they exists in the technology world. You know, when we first we're talking to Eddie, uh, we, we rushed in there with the advice about getting a CI/CD environment set up with a device lab in the cloud. Every buzzword in computing was just being launched at this poor guy. And uh, what we ended up with was um, mobile phones placed on top of toilet rolls, holders, toilet roll tubes, and, and, a, and a measuring tape. Um, to make sure that uh, the, the, the Bluetooth impedance was what it should be. And uh, actually, that's really, that's really what, well, that's what the pandemic has done for us as a discipline in engineering, is it sharpened the mind and got us back to basics yeah. and, and, and taught us that you know, no amount of pomposity will, uh, will be burst by uh, the thought of people getting sick. Thank you. Eddie? I think I'd echo the thing about remote working, um, but I think if I was going to take something that's original is the value of design. I think I've seen it time and time again in any project I've been with, spending the time and getting decent designers and designing a user interface is user testing, working with people. You know, this, we were the first ones to introduce and break the sort of digital ceiling on 16-year-olds uh, for age of consent with the proximity app. We worked with the children's commissioner. We worked with the ICO and we, we got focus groups of kids and got the kids to tell us what they wanted and how we did it. And it's that bit, I think, um, people have known that in the private sector for years. Public sector maybe hasn't been as good at doing it. It's that bit about who's your end users and using design to make it easy for them to do the right thing. If you do that, you, you've, you've got half your problems solved before they arrive. Thank you. Claire. Um, I think for me, it probably is we have broken. We have broken the speed that public sector and especially health works at. I think we've broken lots of people in the process. Um, but for me, I don't think we can go, we can move away from this agile way of working and go back to the, let's have a project initiation document. Let's spend six weeks writing that up. Let's have a waterfall. Let's all, let's set up a whole, whole structure. That whole agile, and I had never worked like that before, that whole agile way of working, a minimal viable project, it, uh, product, iterations, change it as we go, bring the users in, all of those skills. Um, and people have thrived on it. You know, the clinicians love you bringing them in. You know, I sat with a group of school nurses yesterday and said, OK, talk me through your process for, for vaccinating these 12 to 15 year olds in the school. What's going to happen? What's it going to look like? They said, oh, we'll have two queues. One, they'll come in this door, we'll ask them these questions, they'll go out this door. And they love all of that. And they can see me, you know, and, and the user designer drawing the screens as they are talking. Um, and they never would have been involved if we had been using waterfall project management type approach. Well, if we had been using that approach, none of us would be vaccinated in this room now. For which we are all in your debt. And I think Northern Ireland is in in your debt and we're very very grateful for each of your time this afternoon so if i could have a, a round of applause for claire for eddie for andrew and thank you all for coming along this afternoon thank you very much Yay.